we're in Mark chapter 5, and I already mentioned to you as we began that this is the story uh, where Jesus comes across to the other side of the lake, and the things that happen there, which are probably not what the disciples had in mind, although most definitely what Jesus understood was coming. They came to the other side of the sea, beginning in verse 1, to the country of the Gerasenes, and while, when Jesus had stepped out of the boat, immediately there met him out of the tombs a man with an unclean spirit. And if you'll remember, back when we started this study of the Gospel of Mark, we talked about how often he will say immediately. Uh, so many of the stories, if you work your way through looking at the Gospel of Mark, will begin with immediately, which is, I believe, to build in our minds almost an urgency that's going on throughout the Gospel. And maybe an urgency that we have lost out on a, a little bit in our world today. We tend to kind of coast along and just go with what happens, and we don't always feel urgency about things of God. But Mark is... There's a fast pace to what's going on. It just seems to move from thing to thing to thing. And so as Jesus comes across the lake, immediately here is this guy. And this guy is not the kind of guy you want to have approach you. Uh, I, as I was debating about how to start this morning, the, the other direction I was thinking of going in my head is, have you ever been in a place where someone approaches you and you immediately know something is not quite right? This is a person you don't feel entirely safe around. This is somebody that uh, maybe if you were walking down the road and you saw them coming the other way, you might want to widen your path just a little bit because you're unsure about who they are. And this guy would have portrayed all of that to people around him. There was just something about him that was not, not quite right. It says that he lives, lived among the tombs and no one could bind him anymore, not even with a chain. For he had often been bound with shackles and chains, but he wrenched the chains apart and he broke shackles in pieces. pieces. No one had the strength to subdue him. Night and day, among the tombs and on the mountains, he was always crying out and cutting himself with stones. Now, this is a difficult life for him, which is understatement, but could you imagine the community around him and how they would feel about this man? The fact that it says that no one could bind him, what does that mean? What can we infer from that? People had tried. He, he was so troublesome that they thought, you know, maybe if we could just contain this guy somehow. And so they tried to bind him up. And then he would just break that and break through it. And they realized, well, we can't bind him. Let, let's put him out there by the tombs. And if you could imagine what that would be like now. When, when we visit cemeteries, we visit there for uh, funerals. We visit there sometimes to, to put flags out at holidays or to put flowers out to remember someone. Sometimes people will go out there and have a moment, a, a memory, and maybe want to talk to someone because they feel close. Could you imagine if you went out there and there was this guy roaming around? The only place society could push him to was there. And he's out there and he is clearly not himself and he's loud on top of it all. The one thing you want to find when you, when you go to a cemetery is a, a place of peace and quiet and reflection. And what if there's this, this man that just seems out of his mind, tattered clothes, maybe the remnants of chains that have bound him at some point. And he's just yelling and crying out and cutting himself. What would you think of this guy? And would you want to be anywhere near him? I imagine a, a family with their kids. I took my, uh, my older son, David, when he was probably, I don't know, three or four years old. And we went to the National Cemetery in Dallas. And my uncle is buried there. We got out of the car and we walked down one of those rows that you see in National Cemeteries of perfectly placed, lined up uh, stones and we reached the one that was my uncle's, and I talked to him about that, and we were maybe one of two or three cars in the entire cemetery at the time. And it was peace and quiet, and as birds came out of the trees, you could hear them go by. And I try to imagine what it would be like if this guy began to approach. Now, I'd pull my three or four-year-old just a little bit closer to, to make sure that he's not going to get too close. This is life for people around this guy. And this is life for him. I don't know if there are moments along this way where he is close enough in his mind to understand what's going on, to see how people see him, but he can probably remember a time when it wasn't like this. He probably in those moments of lucidity thinks, I, I don't want it to be like this. And yet as I approach people, just even before I've done anything, they're, they're heading the other direction. And so as he approaches Jesus, something very different is going to happen. Instead of Jesus turning and going the other way, it's going to begin a conversation with him and Jesus. So it says, when he saw Jesus from afar, he ran and fell down before him. 
and crying out with a loud voice. And I imagine this guy does everything with a loud voice. He cries out with a loud voice, What have you to do with me, Jesus, son of the most high God? I adjure you by God, do not torment me. For he was saying to him, Come out of the man, you unclean spirit. He knows exactly who Jesus is. The disciples who have been in the boat with Jesus are still figuring that out. They've seen Jesus do amazing things. Their lives have been changed because they're with Jesus. They've watched him heal, and now they've watched him still this storm on the sea where everything's perfectly calm. And they're still probably whispering to themselves quite a bit about, who, who is this? And that was the, the question they had in the boat. Who is this that even the winds and waves obey him? This man, and the demons within him specifically, know exactly who Jesus is. And so when Jesus comes along, they're fearful of what Jesus can do because they don't just understand who Jesus is, they understand his power. Now, I would submit to you that a lot of the trouble we have in life with our spiritual walk, a lot of the trouble we have with faith in God could be solved by us knowing these two things that the demons know. If we just knew beyond any doubt who Jesus is, and if we knew beyond any doubt what Jesus is capable of doing, what his power is, then so many of the things that concern us, so many of the things we worry about, so many of the things we feel out of control in, would begin to feel a little bit better. Because we would know that, yes, these things are all bigger than us. They're things we can't control. They're things we can't change. But Jesus has power over all of this. And whether he chooses to change these things for us or whether he chooses just to guide us through these things, because we have a relationship with him, it's going to be okay. We're going to be all right. And Jesus asked him in verse 9, what is your name? And he replied, my name is Legion, for we are many. And he begged him earnestly not to send them out of the country. We pass over this part of the story a lot because quite honestly, when we read this, this is pretty foreign to us, isn't it? It's a different place. It's a different time. Uh, you may have run across someone in the course of life that you have assumed is probably taken on by demons uh, just by the things they do and what they mean. Uh, every time we have an election in our country, I see that thrown around, that there's somebody who's controlled by demons. I don't think that's exactly what's going on here in the tombs. They have this request not to be sent out of the country. And the, the belief in this time, and this, this almost reinforces the belief, and maybe this is how it works, is when there were these demons or groups of demons, they had an area that was kind of their area. And that area was a place where their power would work. And so what they're asking of Jesus is, whatever it is he's going to do, don't send us away from here. And, and the way a lot of commentators read this is, because if you send us away from here, it's going to be a place where we don't have power anymore. And we don't know for sure if that's what it is. The, the gospel writer doesn't spell it out for us. But for whatever reason, whatever Jesus is going to do, they don't want to be sent away from the place they have power or maybe the place that is familiar to them. Now, what makes me a little uncomfortable as I read this is, this often sounds like a request we would have, doesn't it? I, I don't like when my requests line up with demons' requests. That, that's not a good thing for me. But do we sometimes not ask of Jesus, you know, do what you're going to do with me, Jesus, and help me to be of service in the kingdom, but keep me where I'm comfortable. Whether that's a location or a thing you do or the people you're around, Keep me in a place where I feel that I am in control, in a place where I feel that I have power. How many of us would pray a prayer of, Jesus, take me someplace that I feel completely out of control? Take me to do a thing where I feel like I have no influence or power and I am completely reliant on you. And yet, isn't that the kind of Christian walk that Jesus is driving to? I'm not, I'm not suggesting that we should all leave here and move to another place where we don't know anyone or anything. But isn't part of being a Christian being an alien and stranger in this world isn't part of being a Christian, being someone who completely relies on Jesus. And so what these demons ask is, whatever you're going to do, just don't send us away from here. Now, a great herd of pigs was feeding there on the hillside, and they begged him saying, send us into the pigs, let us enter them. So he gave them permission. And the unclean spirits came out and entered the pigs, and the herd, numbering about 2,000, rushed down the steep bank into the sea and drowned into the sea. Now, of all the things the, the disciples thought they would see over the last day or so, storm that made fishermen fearful, 
And then that storm completely calmed to the point there is no wind and the sea was glass. Now they have gotten off on the other side onto land out of the boat. And this crazy, insane, demon-possessed man comes to them. Chains, tattered clothes, yelling, cutting himself. They just want to walk the other direction. And now they've watched the demons go out of that man into a herd of pigs that runs down a hill into the sea. Wow. So many things going on here. And the thing I don't want us to miss is how much unclean is happening in this story. Now, we have a hint uh, on this idea that he's going to be in the Decapolis in this story that is not a very Jewish area. Uh, or if it is Jewish, they are definitely not in control, that there's a lot of unclean things going on. Because first of all, you have this man is possessed by spirits that spiritually clearly would be thought of as unclean. This is not a guy that would be okay with the religious leaders at all because of this. And secondly, he's living among the tombs. Now, we may not enjoy going to cemeteries because it just feels like a, a sad place, or maybe some people feel like it's, it's a little creepy to be there at night or something like that. They didn't go into tombs because tombs were unclean to them. This is not a place they hung around. They would be in and out as quickly as possible. Third, the demons choose to be sent into these unclean pigs. Uh, as much as I enjoy bacon on a Saturday morning like I did yesterday, this was not something the Jewish people did. They did not eat pigs. And so the idea of there being around pigs was a very unclean thing. And so if there are literally thousands of pigs here in this place near the tombs, this is not a place a Jew would want to be anywhere near. And then last, these unclean pigs, they are destroyed as they go down. So think about just how unclean all of this is, and Jesus comes in to change that. Think also of how Gentile all of this is. If you've been here on Wednesday nights or been watching online, we've been talking about the churches of Galatia and the struggle going on between Jewish Christians and Gentile Christians, and largely over old law kinds of issues. And we've talked about how Paul is the apostle to the Galatians. It's kind of a way he's known. We talked about how Peter early on had this vision about the Gentiles and about how they are going to be welcomed into this gospel message. Uh, some commentators believe that that is beginning right here with Jesus. Here he is in this clearly unclean, Gentile-laden place, and the gospel is going to be shown with what he's going to do. And what about the lives of the pigs? And this is almost an aside, but I will tell you that if you were to come to somebody in our world today who is not a believer, who does not believe in God, is not a member of the church, and you told them this story, I would almost guarantee you that if you were to tell 10 people this story, at least five or six of them would ask you, well, why did he do that to the pigs? That's not okay. You know, we, we like, uh, PETA would definitely be on this. This is the thing they would come after. Well, what about the pigs? Isn't it interesting that at least early on, probably decades ago for a lot of us, when we first heard this story, I'm going to guess that thought didn't cross a lot of our minds. They're, they're almost just a prop in the story. You don't really think much about it. Um, in the Expositor's Bible Commentary, Mark Strauss addresses it this way. Neither Mark nor the gospel writers seem concerned about this question. All apparently assume that these material losses pale in comparison to the eternal significance of one man's deliverance from bondage to Satan. For Jesus, it's always going to be people over pigs. For Jesus, it's always going to be souls over whatever else is going on there. And I tell you, that probably will not help folks accept this idea that much more and that much more quickly, but it is just planting the seed of God cares about people above everything else. I'm not suggesting that we go out and slaughter a whole lot of animals today. I'm not suggesting that God doesn't care about other life. But God always places people at the top of that. God creates through Genesis 1, gets to man, and that is the creation that is very good. Continuing in verse 14. It says, The herdsmen fled and told it in the city and in the country, and people came to see what it was that had happened. And they came to Jesus and saw the demon-possessed man, the one who had the legion, sitting there clothed and in his right mind, and they were afraid. So what is their reaction? Fear. It's not rejoicing. Wouldn't you like the reaction to be, as we read this 2,000 years later from the outside, that everyone knew who this guy was and what he was like? And if you suddenly showed up, and here is this guy in his right mind, speaking sensibly, 
clothed, clean, looking right, wouldn't you be just amazed by that? Wouldn't you want to know what changed? Wouldn't you want to know who was responsible? And wouldn't, even if you didn't know or care about this man directly, wouldn't you just be excited about the life change that had happened? And instead, what you find is fear. The same reaction, by the way, the apostles had as Jesus stills the storm. Fear. There is a power here that we cannot understand, that we cannot control, and what that is often met with is fear. And those who had seen it, verse 16, described to them what had happened to the demon-possessed man and to the pigs. And they began to beg Jesus to depart from their region. Now it is fear, it is ignorance, and it is selfishness. Because if you could get past the fear to maybe, maybe being even neutral about the guy, not getting all the way to rejoicing, wouldn't you want to really know more, not just about what happened that's been described to you just now, but about who this is and how this is possible? If someone did the most miraculous, amazing thing you had ever seen, wouldn't you want to know a little more about how that happened? When I was a kid, and maybe some of your families did this too, there would periodically be these David Copperfield specials that would come on TV. Uh, for those who are younger, you don't get the fascination with this, but David Copperfield was a magician. He would come on TV, and he would do these amazing tricks. And as a kid, I was al always want to know, how did he do that? I, I don't think it's possible that magic actually explains all of that. I think there's some sort of trickery and mirrors and everything else involved, and I, I want to know how the trick worked. Uh, I remember the first time I went to Silver Dollar City in Branson, I walked into the magic store that's by the Thunderation roller coaster there. For those of you who've been, you've known exactly what I'm talking about. There's a little magic shop, and you go in there and you spend five or ten bucks, and it's all these little trinkets where you can do magic tricks. These people are happy with ignorance. They, they don't want to know. And the reason they are fearful and they don't want to know is out of selfishness. Because even though they couldn't control this guy before, they could at least push him off to the side and not have to worry about it. And now, here's a guy who has taken the livelihood of somebody with these thousands of pigs, and he has destroyed it in an instant. And that is not something they welcome to their community. And so they act out of fear and ignorance and selfishness. David Garland, in the NIV application commentary, talks about this section. I, I like what he says. The demons had begged Jesus to let them stay in the region. The townspeople now beg Jesus to leave. They are more comfortable with the malevolent, malevolent forces that take captive human beings and destroy animals than they are with the one who can expel them. They can cope with the odd demon-possessed wild man who terrorizes the neighborhood with random acts of violence, but they want to keep someone with Jesus' power at lake's length. Jesus, why don't you get back in that boat and go right back across where you came from? Is it interesting to you that even though they pushed this demon-possessed man off on the edge of the community, they never removed him completely? I don't know if they thought they couldn't or maybe they tried and it didn't work, but I just imagine these people that are, that are content to have him off here on the side and never take him fully out. But Jesus, we're not going to just have him on the edge of town. He needs to leave and get out of here completely. As he was getting into the boat, the man who had been possessed with demons begged him that he might be with him. Isn't it interesting how many times the person on the edge of society, the blind man, the lame man, the person with leprosy, and here, this demon-possessed man, the ones that everyone wanted to push away, and then they want to push Jesus away too, these people who lived on the edge are the ones who desperately want to be with Jesus. They know what it is like to be with no one, and they want to be with him instead. People do not remain neutral after encountering Jesus. This guy's life is different forever from this day forward, and he wants to continue with the one who has changed it. And shouldn't we want to do the same? We, we all sit here this morning or are watching wherever you're watching because of Jesus, because of what Jesus has done in our lives. Should we not want to be as close to him as is humanly possible? He did not permit him, as we read at the beginning. He did not permit him, but said to him, go home to your friends and tell them how much the Lord has done for you and how he has had mercy on you. So he said to him, go and tell whatever it is you want to put the energy into following, the energy into being here with me instead, I want you to turn around and take that energy and put it, in, put it into telling other people about what happened here, telling other people about me. And he went away and began to proclaim in the Decapolis 
how much Jesus had done for him, and everyone marveled. By the way, this word proclaim, it's the same word we use for preach. You ever thought at the beginning of this story, this guy would end up being a preacher? If you know enough preachers, you probably, yeah, that, that fits. Here he is out proclaiming to everybody what Jesus has done. He was told to go and tell. What does he do? He goes and tells. As we bring all this together, I want to ask you a few questions. Think about this man in this context. Has Jesus done anything for you? You know, if we were to ask this man the question, I will guarantee you he's going to begin the story with where he was before Jesus showed up on the lakeshore that day and where he is today and how everything changed in those 20 verses in his life. For you, you have something that is probably not quite as dramatic as this, or, or maybe you have something that's an unbelievable story. But Jesus has done something in your life. Secondly, will you go and tell? Because that same command that he gives to this man is the command he gives to us. You go to the end of the Gospel of Matthew, and what does it say? Go and teach and baptize, make disciples. So we've been given that same command to go and tell. And third, a question that I probably ask you four or five times, either in class or in our sermons or in the bulletin, who is your one? Who's your one? For each of you who look at this task of taking the gospel to the world and think that is too much, and I am not trained for that or equipped for that, what you are trained and equipped for is one person in your life that needs to hear about this. All of us have one. There is somebody in your life that you have talked to about it before, and they have not given you the time of day, and you've given up. There's somebody in your life that you have thought they will never listen to this, and so I'm not even going to try. Or there's someone in your life that you really think might be receptive, and you just you don't know what to say. And I want you to leave here today never just taking that for granted again. I don't want you to be neutral to Jesus, as so many people feel like they can be. But instead, for that, that one to just light a fire for you that you just can't let go of. In the back today, something a little different than anything we've done before, uh, on the credenza back there, there's a little metal box, uh, and on the front of it, it says, who's your one? And, and in the pocket on that box, and also a few out on the, on the table there in front of it, are little slips of paper say, who's your one on it? And it says, your one's first name, and there's a little blank there. I would like you, as you leave today, or maybe as you leave next week, if you want to think about this and pray about it, to write the name of one person, first name, of one person that you really want to hear the story of Jesus this year. And I want you to write their name on that and put it in that box. And that box will stay out there throughout 2021. It will be a visual reminder to us that we have a one, first of all, and secondly, uh, our elders meet twice a month uh, over next door on Monday nights. Uh, on Monday afternoon, I'm going to come over here every Monday, grab that box, take it to the room we meet in, and we are going to take some names out of there every week, and we are going to pray for your person by name that they will find the gospel this year. Now, the trouble is, that's going to mean you're going to start working, and you are going to find ways to talk to them about the gospel. Now, every now and then, it might be that through that prayer, God leads someone else to them. And maybe you will find out it happened before you even got up the courage to do it. Who knows? But each of us has someone in our lives that we are to take the gospel to. And I hope you will write a name down. Do a couple if you've got a couple. That's fine. And we will pray and work towards those people this year. There was, uh, in the early 1950s, a drive by the U.S. Navy. And their intention uh, during the early 1950s was they wanted to build the largest, fastest troop transport that they had ever had. And so they began construction on what would later be christened the USS United States. They couldn't come up with a more original name, I guess. The USS United States was, when it was completed, the largest, fastest troop transport ever made. It was just shy of 1,000 feet long. It was 990-something feet long. It would hold 15,000 troops. It would travel at 50 miles an hour across open water. And it could get 15,000 of our troops anywhere in 10 days or less. Pretty amazing feat. Uh, unbelievable engineering and construction and the amount of time it took to build it. Uh, I think I read that in today's dollars it would have been just crazy money, but it was in the millions even then. That ship, when completed was never used to move troops, 
ever. They spent millions of dollars, all the time, all the design work. Do you know what that, troop, uh, that ship became? It became a luxury liner. That USS United States became a luxury liner that shipped dignitaries, it shipped uh, entertainers across to uh, do USO shows and that kind of thing. Uh, it was in service for, I believe, 17 years, something like that. Never took the 15,000 troops in 10 hours at 50 miles an hour anywhere. It became a luxury liner. It was designed for battle and became instead the first air-conditioned, fully air-conditioned luxury liner ever. Not what they had in mind. We as a church are in danger of being designed for battle, as Jeff talked about in class today, and instead becoming the luxury liner. Because all of us have had that one, and that one did just not magically appear in your life the first time I gave you that three-word phrase earlier this year. That one has been in your life for a long time. That one has been in my life for a long time. And we have been content to sit on the luxury liner and think someone else will take care of that. And I am here to tell you that if we all think that way, those people are never going to be reached for the gospel. Of all people, to be an example to us, a demon-possessed man who came running, yelling, seemingly out of his mind, shows us that any of us are capable of taking that story to others. Today, if you have never done that, do not leave here content to continue that way. Do not leave here content to be a big, fast luxury liner. Instead, change because Jesus changed you. This morning, if you have never heard that message before, I apologize because somebody should have told you by now. But don't leave here neutral. This morning, if you're watching wherever you're at, get in contact with us and we will put you in contact with Jesus. Today, if you have fallen away from him, know that you can come back if you want to follow him for the first time and be baptized and change your life every bit as dramatically as this man in the story. You can do that as together we stand and sing.